Um, so uh, if you missed the beginning um, or if you have additional um, sort of detailed points, please feel free to refer to, um, to the recording that will, will be sent out to everyone. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, welcome to the Strange Beast Making Sense of Pago Solar Business Models uh, webinar. My name is Pepukai Bardwil. Uh, I'm with the International Finance Corporation based in Johannesburg um, and have for several years now focused on um, business models uh, to scale up energy access, primarily in the mini grid space, but also in the solar home system space. I'm joined by four colleagues, um, Alexander Sotiru, uh, who's with CGAP. Um, at, uh, at CGAP, uh, Alexander focuses on financial innovations for development, um, which is a very specific project aimed at catalyzing um, innovation uh, to address some of those challenges in international development, including in the energy, water, and education spaces. Uh, Gianmaria Bansuli, uh, who is with the World Bank, he has a background in engineering and finance and has worked for several years on plan planning strategy and as well as energy access in the Middle East and Africa. Um, by Dan Gode, uh, who is a professor with with New York University Stern, uh, where he has worked for several decades teaching corporal fi corporate financial accounting. Um, his primary research area is financial analysis, uh, legal liability of firms, valuation, and managerial accounting. And Chad Larson, who's a co-founder of MCOPA Solar, uh, one of the pioneering companies in the pay-as-you-go solar industry. Um, MCOPA has connected over 600,000 households um, to affordable solar power, primarily in East Africa. And Chad has extensive work experience in um, the financial sector, um, including as head of structured and municipal products at Bank of America, uh, amongst others. So welcome uh, to my co-presenters and panelists um, and speakers. Um, we will be covering four points in our agenda today. I've just gone over the introduction. Um, over the next 15 minutes or so, uh, my colleagues Alexander and Jamaria will cover a summary of findings, um, basically uh, the focus of the Strange Beast paper. We will then have a discussion for about 15 minutes, um, during which we'll focus on Dan Gode and Chad Larson, um, and that will be an interactive and, and moderated discussion, which I will lead. And we'll then open the floor to questions and answers um, from participants over the WebEx for about 20 uh, or 25 minutes. Um, before we get going, uh, in about a minute, uh, with the presentation, I just wanted to say that Strange Beast um, is a paper that uh, came out of an observation um, that a number of us who've been involved in writing the paper had in parallel around the pay-as-you-go space. Uh, we'd seen tremendous development in the sector, um, tremendous excitement around the potential of pay-as-you-go companies to connect um, hundreds of thousands possibly hundreds of millions of people who don't have access to energy and provide them with clean, affordable services that are not necessarily limited to energy access. But in um, looking at the sector from different angles, from the CGAP perspective, from the, the IFC perspective, um, we had a, a number of observations that compelled us to put together a, a report which we released at the beginning of this year in January. Um, if anyone has not seen the report, we are happy to send it to you. Um, but we hope that the uh, focus of this presentation, um, so the detail in which we go, covers the main points um, and very much look forward to the discussion. So with that, uh, I hand over to Alexander and Jamaria to go into the details. Thank you, Pep, for the introduction and, and thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, before we get too far into this, I, I want to share an image and, and one thought that I hope will be sort of the key one that that you will take away from this uh, presentation. I, I think it's one image that has a potential to, to really unlock uh, the, the, the secrets of the pay as you go business model. And, and that image is the one of the duck-billed platypus. So you, you may, of course, be asking, what in the world does a platypus and a pay as you go solar home system company have in common? Well, let's, let's take a close look at this platypus, this, this animal. It has a bill kind of like a duck. It's shaped a little bit like a beaver. It lays eggs, but supposedly it's a mammal. Uh, the thing about platypus is they're very difficult to classify. And so too with this strange beast that we've called pay-as-you-go solar home system company. So you can ask yourselves, is a pay-as-you-go solar home system company a off-grid energy utility that sells energy as a service? Is it a financial institution that uh, provides lending or, or leasing in some way, shape, or form? Or maybe it's just a, a retailer that's selling something that's of high value to its customers. 
or perhaps it's, it's actually none of the above or some combination, uh, or there are multiple iterations. The challenge here is that these companies are involved in a wide variety of activities. So, you know, for example, they're operating uh, some of the design and manufacturing, but they also do inventory management and a uh, form of underwriting. They do potentially leasing. They do customer research, origination. This bundle of activities can be hard to wrap your mind around. Uh, so one of the approaches that we took in this paper was uh, to try and see if we could unlock some operational, strategic, and financial analysis insights by taking this jumble of activities and aligning them into value chains. So we took exactly those blocks that I had in the previous slide and arranged them here into a type of framework using a value chain. Uh, so on the retail side, uh, which is a, a very intuitive type of value chain where you first have design, manufacture, and at the very end there's somebody selling uh, uh, something and then some sort of after-sales support. Uh, on the lending leasing side, it's, there's a number of activities there as well that are, that are distinct. Uh, so by, just by taking this exercise of putting things into this framework, uh, we think that you, we can get to a number of insights. And I should pause for a second to say that, you know, this doesn't necessarily describe every PAYGO company that's ever existed or, or will exist, but we think that this is an accurate characterization of the leading PAYGO players uh, as, as they operate today, although the environment seems to be changing. But when we look at this specific instance, uh, we think that we can get two insights out of this. First, that they're vertically integrated, so focusing just on the retail uh, value chain for a moment, we see that the, main, the, the leading companies are involved in everything from the design and manufacture all the way down through the sales and after sales support. At the same time, um, they are also operating across two value chains. So you may think of this as, as a horizontal as well as a vertical integration. So the lending leasing value chain is, is quite distinct from the retail one. And questions are, you know, how, what's the best way to deliver this bundle of services to a customer? So just thinking through the operational challenges that this creates for, for companies, some are quite intuitive in that it just requires a diverse set of skills that need to be mastered. For a retail company, for example, supply chain management is, is critical, customer service, and, and a range of other things that are maybe specifically important to retail companies. For a lender, on the other hand, probably the most critical success factor is their ability to manage uh, credit risk and to be able to match their liabilities to their assets. These are different skill sets, and being successful in any one set of them across one value chain is difficult. It's hard to be a lender. It's hard to be a retail company. It's infinitely more difficult to be good at doing both. So that raises a number of uh, uh, strategic questions. Namely, does it actually make sense for companies to do all of these things themselves? Should they outsource part of those activities to other more specialized companies that could be better at one component in the value chain. Or maybe they should partner with a company and, and deliver the services together, working jointly and in close coordination with, with another company. So these are important operational and strategic challenges that we highlight, but we don't necessarily go into too much depth. The rest of the paper focuses mainly on financial analysis challenges. And just to get a sense of, of what we're referring to here and, and what this a uh, combination of activities, the, the challenges that poses for a company. Consider the balance sheet, or the, pardon, the income statement of a, a lender versus a retailer. So here we have just a few stylized top lines from an income statement of a typical uh, lender or retailer. And we can see from the retailer, we start from revenue, we subtract cost of goods sold, and then we get to something we call gross profit. From a lender, for a lender, looking at their income statement, we focus on interest. So first we take their interest income and then we subtract their uh, interest expense and we get to something we call net interest income. This is a fundamental difference in the business model that's reflected in a fundamental difference in how the performance of that business is, is uh, assessed, which leads to fundamentally different uh, indicators to assess that performance. So for a retailer, we might look at gross margin. For a lender, we would look at net interest margin. And it would be a mistake. It would be a categorical mistake to apply the type of analysis that you apply to a lender, focusing so much on income, 
to a retailer, and vice versa, it would be a categorical mistake not to analyze the interest when you're looking at a lender. So in the paper, we go into uh, a couple of other more developed industries where there are some analogs to these sorts of issues. It's, it, this isn't a set of issues that's, that's necessarily unique to the PAYGO uh, space, so we, we tried to find some best practices from other industries, and I'll just share one uh, idea here, and that is that of the automobile companies. Most automobile companies also provide lending to the end customers at the end of the day to help the customers buy the automobile. Uh, that creates a problem when you aggregate the financial statements and you jumble these, these two together. So uh, question is, you know, what is the best practice that has emerged in, in that uh, uh, space when it comes to financial analysis? And here I just want to share a quick quote from Fitch Ratings from their automobile rating criteria. So they, in fact, do try to deconsolidate the numbers uh, because of this issue that the financial service captive uh, companies of auto manufacturers have very different metrics. You know, their, their balance sheets tend to be larger, their profit margins are different. We just walked through just a little bit of an example of what the difference would be between uh, two different types of companies. And so when you jumble those together, it creates a distortion and a best practice that has emerged in the auto manufacturing space is to try and disaggregate them whenever possible. So uh, inspired in part by, by some of these uh, analogies, we went and conducted an analysis, and I'll, I'll pass it over to my uh, colleague, Gian Maria, who's going to walk you through some of what we did. Thank you very much, Alexander. And yes, um, and considering the analogy that Alexander has just mentioned with the manufac car manufacturing industry, we created a um, uh, um, financial model for uh, an ideal PAYGO holding company. And uh, we thought that uh, instead of just having uh, a set of consolidated financial statements for the company, uh, we thought it made sense to approach uh, um, this subject in a, in a way that we create two sets of financial statements. One for the part of the company that in our model we call OPCO, that deals with uh, more the retail part, the manufacturing part of the solar home system. And one other part of the company that we call Finco, that is basically uh, financing the customer that uh, have uh, the leasing, the lease the solar home system. So just to explain how the, the, the whole process works, we have the customers that uh, um, in, in pay to the OCO an initial fee for the solar home system and a promise to pay over time can be depend on the agreement one or two years and a promise to pay for the remaining part of a, a lease to own solar home system. At this point, the OCO, the mm, retail part of the company, will record on the balance sheet the uh, account receivable which uh, will be transferred to the FINCO. So the, the, the part of the company that uh, provides consumer financing has all the account receivable which, uh, um, um, will, which, on which we charge an interest to the monthly payment that the customer submits to, uh, to the FINCO. So at the end of the day, the customer will have the initial relationship with the operational part of the company, but will pay on a monthly basis uh, the, um, the financial side of the company. Uh, why did we did this? Because we thought that there were some, uh, um, as Alexander mentioned, when we approach uh, vertically integrated companies, uh, it's very difficult to understand from their financial statement the real key performance indicators uh, of uh, um, the different uh, business lines that the company have, has. For example, EBITDA, um, earning before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortizations. Um, EBITDA is, is frequently used, is commonly used uh, in finance uh, to um, provide a quick uh, understanding of a performance of a company. But on top of being um, uh, having some pitfalls, for example, does not take in consideration all the capital expenditures during the life of the project. In these particular cases, when we approach uh, vertically integrated companies, in the PAYSIGO model, we saw that the EBITDA of the company is, uh, uh, was negative. The more co the company was growing, the more the EBITDA was negative. Was that a, um, a bad sign? Actually, if we look more into the details, it's not necessarily a bad sign. It's just because uh, the EBITDA does not uh, recognize, based on its formula, 
the revenue that is brought to the table by the financial side of the company. As Alexander properly mentioned, the, what we call FINCO, the financial side of the company, mainly has interest income and interest expenses. So these two interests are below the line of EBITDA. So if we just analyze the EBITDA, we will not have a proper information on the status of the company. In fact, when um, we break down the um, financial statement in two sets of financial statements, one for the OPCO and one for the FINCO, we saw that they're both generating income. So that's the only way for us to understand how profitable, how proper is the pay-to-go pay company is to go to a lower level of detail, separating the financial statements. The other point that we, we saw was a little bit confusing was the cash flow from operation. We saw that the consolidated cash flow from operation of the Pego company is negative. So um, does, uh, is that necessarily bad? I mean, if, if for a general company, yes, it is bad. But for this particular case where we have uh, um, an operational part of the company and a, a consumer finance inside of the company, the reason why the cash flow from operation is, is negative because we have a tremendous grow year over year in account receivable. As you can see from the gray line here, the account receivable goes go up to almost uh, like an increase to up to 15, 16 million dollars after the few years of operation. That is not necessarily bad because that is an indicator that the company is growing because the way this company grows is kind of customers that do not pay everything up front. But we saw also Pepe and I and also with Alexander from preview experience that there are like uh, customers that sign like free year lease. So the, the, the increase in account receivable is actually a good sign because it means that the company is growing. The reason that uh, we see that here uh, as negative does not, uh, um, to, is not a concern for us, but is actually a proper sign. Uh, another thing that we need to take in consideration, um, when we address account receivable and we see that they are growing so fast, the other po important point is the portfolio quality. So as long as the FINCO has a portfolio quality of account receivable of its customer that is, is good, that's, uh, that's uh, um, a proper sign for the company. And as long as the FINCO part of the company is capable to raise money at a lower, lower interest rate than the one charged to the customer, it means that the company is making money. That's typical of a financial institution. So uh, the last point we want to point out among all the, all the findings that we saw in the paper that, uh, that we prepared was uh, the, what we call misleading average. And as we know, the debt equity ratio of uh, uh, many companies that are manuf in manufacturing in, uh, in sales distribution is uh, substantially lower than uh, what we have seen when we consolidate the operations of uh, um, the, Finco, the, the pay as you go company. Because we see that after a few years, I mean, we, we, we see that the debt equity ratio goes up to 100%, which is not typical. In fact, we can only understand this when we break down the financial statements between the OPCO and the FINCO. We see the OPCO, the part of the company that does more the retail business, has a debt equity ratio way, be, way below 40-30%, which is in line with the type of business this company is in. Contrary, the FINCO has a very high debt equity ratio, which is typical for financial companies, which is typical for consumer leasing companies because they have a very heavy balance sheet. So this is something that, um, that uh, uh, only breaking down the financial statements in two sets of financial statements will be able to address. Uh, to conclude this uh, uh, part of the presentation, we, at this point, we, we, were, we were trying to provide some uh, uh, advice or suggestions to investors that uh, approach, uh, in, uh, have their first approach in the pay to go market. And we thought it was important to outline some sort of a framework. For example, what are the activities the company is involved in? As Alexander mentioned, it, there are so many activities for vertical integrated companies that it's very important to do a map of the value chain. The next step, understand which are the activities that it makes sense keeping in house and which ones should be outsourced. Outsourced. At that point, we will be able to, um, to decide whether it, it makes sense keep remaining vertically integrated uh, despite operating across multiple value chains. 
If we think it's not proper to keep remaining vertically integrated, well, there are other important decisions that we have to make, which uh, will be addressed further in uh, um, other studies that we are working on. But we actually think, yes, it makes sense for a pay-as-you-go pay company remaining vertically integrated, considering the challenging environment they operate in. We, uh, we thought that the best way to um, analyze the performance of, a, of this kind of companies would have been proceeding with a spectrum of separation. What does that mean? First of all, um, we were thinking to have an internal uh, um, management accounting exercise for the entire company and to identify some uh, key performance indicators for all the integrated operations. The next step will be start dividing each business unit and start breaking down the financial statement, the integrated financial statement, in uh, each part, in two sets of financial statements, with proper KPI, the ones that will be identified, one for the operational part of the company and one for the financial part of the company. The next step uh, can be either stay as it is or maybe try to securitize the receivable uh, through an SPV, but we thought that would be more interesting actually start forming two separate legal entities, one that we can call OPCO, the other, as we say, we call FINCO, two separate legal entities under the umbrella of the pay-to-go company, under the umbrella of the holding company. Why do we want to have two separate legal entities? First of all, because uh, investors uh, with uh, some, some level of expertise in the financial industry, they will, under, they will use the key performance indicator of the FINCO to bring more money, to invest more money in the FINCO part of the company. In venture capitalists with more expertise in retail distribution manufacturing will have the, some set of indicators that are familiar with that will help us to invest in the operational part of the company. Of course, there are issues about transfer pricing between the FINCO and the OPCO that we need to take care of. But we think that with this approach, we will be able to bring more money to the industry because the investor will understand much better all the components of uh, the PAYGO holding company. And having said that, I'm ha happy to pass it to, to Pep for the uh, continuation of the presentation. Thank you very much, um, Alexander and Jamaria. Um, I have not seen any questions posted in the chat, um, and I assume that that's simply because um, the presentation is so comprehensive, but also possibly very overwhelming. Um, so let me please just remind everyone to please, you know, feel free um, to post any of the questions that you have. Otherwise, um, of course, jump in when we get into um, uh, the sort of open uh, audience discussion in about uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, there are no wrong or, or bad questions, uh, so, so please don't feel shy. Um, perhaps I could start with Chad and, and then move on to, to Dan. Um, Chad, you have a fascinating background. You're running one of the most successful pay-as-you-go companies, so you are uh, an expert uh, to, some, you know, uh, to some degree in operations, but you've also got a background in finance, uh, which makes you um, the perfect target for, you know, for, for the difficult question, which is um, how we, and, and if I may just ask um, uh, our IT colleagues to move back to slide 17, um, in proposing the three options um, within this framework, have we got this right? Have we, have we missed something? Are we overcomplicating things? Um, I guess my question is, do you believe that the issues that we've outlined um, and that uh, Jamaria and Alexander have presented are relevant um, based on what is going on in the sector today? Um, are they overstated, possibly understated? Well, uh, yeah, I, mean, no, I, I, I think these are, these are crucial issues for the industry, and I think a lot of the challenges outlined are what, what makes traditional financial analysis very difficult on these companies. And the suggested solution here is something that would uh, greatly bring a lot more clarity and reduce, as mentioned, uh, some key errors um, that uh, you might make when you have combined financials for uh, for such an entity. And I might just go through each of those and just add a bit more color on those uh, those errors, which were mentioned as EBITDA, cash flows, and leverage. Um, on the first one for EBITDA, um, the issue there is for one of the companies, the, if you think of this as two companies, the OPCO, uh, EBITDA may be a good measure because interest uh, is not an important part of a technology company that produces hardware. 
designs a software platform and has a sales organization. So you, the interest component might just be a, a leverage choice that a company might make. But for the FinCo or the bank, the embedded bank, that I is critical. So EBITDA is not the right way to look at a bank, which is why you don't hear that measure applied uh, by, uh, when applied to, uh, to banks in, in analysis. So splitting the two uh, basically means that you can do traditional bank analysis on the profitability, which is the net interest margin minus the defaults uh, and then minus operating costs. And then you can, do, you can look at EBITDA as, as a key measure on, the, on, on the, uh, the tech company or the OPCO. Um, on the second one, uh, for cash flows, uh, as was mentioned by uh, Gina Maria, um, the, you, know, you have a situation where the, the statement of cash flow from operations looks dreadful for these companies, but what you're really seeing is the growth of their loan book. That's what drains that cash flow downward, uh, is substantially the growth of the loan book. Uh, what was referred to as a, a, a greatly growing accounts receivable, I would see as basically a bank that's growing their loan book, which is healthy as long as they're managing their, their net interest margin and their defaults and their operating uh, costs uh, effectively. Um, so when you split that out, um, you would look at the opco with a tr traditional cash flow from operations uh, angle. But on the bank side, you would see basically the growth of the loan book and hopefully the growth of the liabilities that fund that loan book. Just like in a bank, you'd want to see some you know, deposit growth commensurate with the loan growth. Otherwise, you're loaning from your equity and putting a drain on your equity return for your investors. You, know, you can look at that the same way, and it greatly increases the, the clarity uh, when looking at those financials. And then finally, as mentioned on the leverage side, you know, it can look like these companies, which typically account for themselves, uh, like trading companies, it looks like they have high leverage relative to uh, the business that they're in. But when you separate it out, as mentioned, you know, even that 300% um, debt to equity ratio for a bank is actually, you know, that's quite healthy. Uh, there's nothing to worry about at that ratio. And then on the Opco side, they might, they might use some leverage maybe to fund uh, some working capital for, um, uh, for goods in transit or something like that, but the leverage ratio, ratio would be low or, no, or perhaps no leverage would be used at all. Um, so basically splitting these out recognizes the two different distinct businesses that you're in, and it allows an analyst to take a look at it and really understand it, whether it's from an investor or, or even internally you know, with, with uh, the internal management accountants. I think internally it will help clarify uh, for the management as far as where they're doing, where the, where they're doing well and where they're not. Um, and I think that last point is actually you know, probably the most critical part here is this, this really for the management can really lead to good practice if they understand it. Because what happens in businesses that have an embedded lending operation is there's always the uh, pressure or temptation uh, to, to lower underwriting standards in, uh, in order to increase sales. And this is not just in pay-as-you-go solar. This, I'm certain, would happen in the auto industry that have a captive, um, uh, captive lender you know, if your car is not as competitive with another another maker's car, you know, you might basically encourage the lending side to offer easier credit terms. Or, you know, same with like say a, a retailer that issues store credit cards. Uh, if they're missing, you know, year-on-year uh, -year, same month sales, they might say, well, why don't we loosen up the standards a bit on the credit card, and then and then we can hit those sales numbers. And you've just shifted the problem over to the financing side. So by separating these two and actually having owners of each P&L you can kind of create the proper sort of ownership of that where those, those incentives are uh, less likely to lead to bad outcomes. The bad outcome being one side is heavily subsidizing the other. Now, as mentioned, you know, there's an issue around arm's length pricing here because um, for the time being, these companies are likely not to actually spin off these two subsidiaries, the Opco and the Finco or the bank. Um, so they're going to have to, for this purpose, figure out arm's length pricing. But I guess the, the good news is there, are some, there is some disaggregation in this market where there are some uh, companies out there that simply pro provide the hardware and software suite. So you could basically take a look at the price of similar uh, spec products from those to set the arm's length pricing uh, between, the, between the two entities, um, uh, which would be important. And, and even just having that discussion will probably create value within the organization because it might tell you, hey, you know, we're really good on the bank side. We manage our credit risk well. We manage our currency risk, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that a bank needs to be good at. But we're not competitive on the, uh, on, on the OPCO side because when you look at a real arm's length pricing, as I can observe from external co uh, companies that are selling similar product, 
you know, our Opco is not making money, maybe because that's because their manufacturing costs are too high, or they have a bloated, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, tech cost for for maintaining the platform, or whatever it might be. But you know, separating that out will start to basically, um, you know, increase the resolution that you can have on each of the distinct um, uh, functions within the. Uh, uh, within the business. And finally, I think what that ultimately leads to, if, if you think of these companies as some of them being funded by venture capital firms or others who are looking for an exit, I think, you know, for a buyer uh, or, or a new investor, you know, first of all, it becomes much easier to analyze the company. Second, you have the possibility that someone might want to invest in the bank, but not the opco. You need to obviously separate the op these out into distinct legal entities and figure out all the related party contracts between the two legal entities. But you could have, you know, a lower uh, return, lower risk investor looking at the bank side because you'd be saying, listen, these guys have a history of managing their uh, their loan book well. They manage the credit risk, the FX risk well. We want to invest here because we know. These, uh, this balance sheet only goes up when loans have been originated and there's a history of them managing it well. Where on the OPCO side, you're looking at probably more of a high risk, high return sort of investment because they might be only as good as their next bit of next generation of hardware that they're going to roll out in six months. And will that be as attractive to customers um, as, as the previous versions? Just like, you know, just like you look at a car maker, they're only as good as, you know, the next, right. they have some brand value that will bring some buyers buying for a long time, but then they're only as good as you know, their, their next few products. And those have to be competitive, both in features and price. Um, so, you know, for, for companies moving toward a potential exit, I think this increases the chance, which could be, Kind of an exit that takes place in you know two potentially two different companies, but initially realistically this will be a management accounting exercise within the companies that potentially could lead to separate companies that could could be spun off and, and stand on their own eventually as we see this industry mature, and as we see um, you know it be, become more and more disaggregated. Thanks very much, Chad. And actually this tees up the question that I um, that I had in my mind for Dan uh, Gudi. Um, Dan, look, you have, again, extensive experience working with investors, um, with many of the leading hedge funds, with banks, with, uh, you know, with private equity players. So you're coming at this um, very much from the sort of financing perspective. Um, Chad has already alluded to the fact that, you know, what the sector is doing is perhaps not so different from what the auto industry or, or store credit cards have done um, for some time. Um, from from your angle, what do you see as um, as, uh, as sort of the key concerns that a Wall Street investor would have um, for this opportunity? Because again, and um, we're looking at pay as you go solar as you know possibly the current and the future um, for, uh, for for many countries um, where energy access remains a challenge. So in theory, there is you know a very significant opportunity. There's 1.1 billion people who don't have access to energy. Um, what would a Wall Street banker say? Um, from what we've just described, is it good enough um, to go with uh, with separate, uh, you know, with separate statements? Um, do we need uh, the sector to take a bit of a, a, a sort of a, a larger leap um, into disaggregation into separate companies? Um, can they take it stepwise, or or do we need to jump uh, across a bit faster? Thank you. So I'm going to start with some overall comments and then address your question specifically. Whenever I'm looking at any company as an investor, I need disaggregated data that is organized in a way that makes analysis easier because I may want to compare pieces of the company to its peers. So this kind of uh, analysis where the operating company is reporting separately from the FinCo, or at least there are sections of the financial statement that helps me analyze these two parts is absolutely needed. Uh, but then if you have to step back and ask the broader question, what would I as an investor care about? And I will uh, separate my comments into three parts. First, an investor would ask, who am I competing with? Because uh, that's what drives the returns at the end of the day. And what am I investing in and what is the risk return profile? If you start with, as an investor asking the question, who am I competing with? One of the things that needs to be mentioned is many commercial investors I talk to do not want to compete with social investors because social investors are willing to accept lower returns to promote worthy causes. And this is something I've heard from people that, um, that concerns them. And then many of them are not familiar with this sector, but the number of well-informed investors is growing. And if they see a financial statement that they can comprehend, 
uh, use standard metrics at least for the pieces of the company uh, that will help uh, go a long way in encouraging investments the third question i get asked is why are local investors not investing in these projects and part of the problem is that the high government bond yields in africa divert investments away from these projects to financing government deficits so that keeps the cost of capital high and then the overall market size is quite small for big investors but the good news is as the companies get more established and grow in size uh the investor interest is growing so this is going to improve over time the second question i would ask as an investor is what am i investing in and as many of you have said pego companies design their systems assemble them in many cases or get it assembled by somebody they definitely distribute many of these systems and then service them and then the fin finco side finances their customers and uh, somebody has to manage the collections process legally and administratively i think initially it's going to be very difficult to separate these roles because if the product is not designed and assembled to be of a sufficiently high quality the customers will refuse to continue paying for a broken product and you will get defaults so finco is going to get stuck with opco's poor performance uh and people who are investing just in the finco side will always worry about what is the quality of the product that the op that opco has delivered and then the it and customer service systems of the pego company are needed to service the systems that have been sold and if that service is not up to par many poor customers may refuse to pay and they also need these systems to collect payments uh because this payments are collected from a geographically dispersed group of customers and so i think initially it will be quite difficult to securitize these receivables the companies will have to get sufficiently large for uh that securitization as we know it to continue to start playing a major role in this sector there will be some transactions here and there but for it to take off in a big way or uh, will require further development of the business model the closest business i can think of with the pego solar is actually not auto financing but the financing of mobile phones in the us autos are big uh they can be tracked easily it is worthwhile to repossess them but if you think of mobile phones the product is small and mobile uh so is the solar system both can be stolen easily or um uh, are subject to being moved and not be traceable even if the customer starts uh, stops paying it is actually not worthwhile to repossess the product given the small ticket size uh and there is technology available now to lock out phones and that's what telecom companies are using and some pego solar companies have mobile phone chips embedded in their systems others have some other means of making sure that the customer is paying up uh in order to continue using the product uh, mobile phones have a shorter life than solar systems but except the battery part of the solar systems and if you think about how verizon and at&t and others have been financing the phones that their customers want to buy many of these companies understand that if the customers bought their phones on the credit card the interest rates are a lot higher because the credit card companies uh, have no real ability to use these phones as any kind of collateral so the mobile phone companies have chosen to finance many of these phones and uh, they can lock these phones which credit card companies cannot do and the customer is in the store so the loan acquisition cost is zero and these phone companies have used uh, their own internal credit scores in many cases because in some cases it's not worthwhile to go obtain a fico score if you are selling somebody a 7 800 phone or even 500 phone so i have read in verizon's financial statement that they look at seven month history of payments before they are willing to finance a customer and uh, so the customers in many cases even if they have a fico score the company doesn't know it and initially these companies found it very hard to securitize them so they financed these phones using their own balance sheet that is they issued bonds 
and use the money to finance the phones. Then they did private securitizations uh, with banks, and now they're moving into public securitizations as investors get more comfortable with the risk profile, and there is more data on defaults. And the third piece of this uh, Pago Solar sector is, Pago companies have data on customers that is not pub publicly available, and there is the currency risk and government instability risk, crop failure risk. There is also audit risk. Uh, if the phones are being sold or, or mobile uh, uh, Pago solar systems are being sold to customers who are sp spread geographically, it's very hard to audit which phones, uh, which systems are installed where, and uh, what the quality of those systems is. So if, even if an um, audit firm is asked to audit Pago Solar's uh, companies, it's not an easy audit. And there is, of course, there is a risk of spread of electrical grids, such as in India, which made many of the Pago Solar systems models uh, obsolete to some extent. Uh, the investors will see growth opportunities because Pago Solar companies are have and will continue to expand into bigger ticket items such as color TVs and other items, home appliances over time. So this could be a way to latch on to a much bigger growth model. The suggestions I have for the Pago sector would be to create centralized databases regarding customers that combine data from Pago Solar and mobile phone companies in Africa. So that way uh, there is more data on customers before the customers are granted credit and there is more comfort that investors might have as to what the credit card, uh, what the credit profile of these customers is. And a private industry equivalent of like the Aadhaar card in India is sorely needed. It has become cheaper by the day as the technology keeps improving. And another thing to note, and this is my final comment, industry consolidation will lower operational risk and provide diversification. Too many small players are not going to attract significant investors, uh, investments. You need uh, larger Pago solar companies to operate in this space. Um, I'm done with my comments. Back to you. Thanks very much, Dan. Hugely insightful. Um, I think there are a number of uh, directions we could take um, this conversation, and we don't have that much time, but I just want to um, recognize that we have a participant by the name of Kevin Kennedy um, who did jump in with a comment. Um, and his comment, as I'm sure everyone can see in the chat section, is that transparent transfer costs between the OPCO and the FINCO are essential to make this work. And of course, um, I think this, this relates to an earlier part of the conversation. Um, you can treat the OPCO as a broker earning a fee on each deal into the portfolio plus uh, an allocated cost of funding. Um, I don't know if uh, either Chad or Dan would like to jump in on that particular uh, observation. Um, yeah, this is Chad speaking. So, you know, the way, I guess the way I think about that would be, um, you know, if you think about um, like the, the, the mortgage or, uh, the origin, origination and, um, and uh, uh, distribution model, you know, um, the uh, a mortgage broker might have certain criteria uh, from someone who's willing to buy mortgages at a certain price as long as they comply with these terms. So when they, when they, uh, when they do the deal with the customer, they already know who the buyer is. And I guess you, you could think about that to the extent the OPCO controls the sales side is the same thing. They might know as long as the down payment level is this and the terms are this, that you know, our affiliated financing arm is going to pay us $127 for this loan. And the loan to the customer might be $200 that comes in over time, uh, but they know they'll get $127. And they better be able to work within their costs and be profitable on $127 per unit, where the other $63 uh, for the FinCo, which is the, um, the um, total price of the customer minus uh, the price that they paid for the loan, they have to work within that. And you could call that interest. Uh, I, I, I think that's, that's effectively how you think about it. And you'd have to basically manage that. Um, and you'd, that, you'd have some FX risk eat away from that. You'd have some default eat away from that. And of course, operating costs. So I would, you know, I think that's a, that's a decent sort of analog of um, how to think of it. But I agree, the transfer pricing is absolutely crucial uh, for this to happen because, you know, realistically, you're not going to have to a complete arm's length sort of transaction between two parties in a competitive market to kind of test that price. Yeah, and to further uh, build on those comments, 
the home is a fixed asset. Uh, that so the repossession is feasible. It's much more expensive, and you don't need the bank to be really maintaining the home. The maintenance of the home and the collections can be uh, off outsourced to other entities. Whereas with Pago Solar, you need the Opco systems to actually collect payments and to maintain these uh, relationships. So it's going to be difficult to separate initially the operating side from the financing side for that reason. That doesn't mean one should not see the operating and financial statements separately uh, from and bake in some transfer pricing to provide those statements. But a legal separation and kind of contractual separation will be hard to come by because the Pago Solar is different from the mortgage market quite a bit. Thanks very much. Um, and with that, um, I realize that we're running a little bit over time here. Um, I think it may make sense to open to uh, the audience. Um, if anyone has any questions, please uh, feel free to chime in. You'll need to unmute your mic. Um, or is that being done centrally? This is uh, just audio broadcast only. The, the participants are, are unable to, to chime in verbally. So need to uh, send questions to all, all participants via the chat function, uh, ideally. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, please feel free to chat, uh, chat in your questions um, if, there are, uh, if there are any additional points. Um, and while you're thinking about that, um, perhaps I'll bring this back to the real world world uh, in terms of what investors are looking for. So, Dan, um, you have touched upon a number of interesting perspectives, um, you know, what investors would in theory uh, be asking for. Chad, are you seeing investors ask these types of questions now? Has, um, have things changed over the past 6, 12 months? Uh, not suggesting that our paper is trying to shift the market, but um, have you seen harder questions be asked as the sector has started to really mature um, over the past um, 12 plus months. Well, I mean, I, I think the, the, you know, perhaps the big change is this disaggregation and that there, there are um, companies that are just providing the hardware and software suite. And then they're typically bought by, I guess you could say these are sort of FinCos, but usually the, the distribution sits on that side as well. So they're running a sales operation and the, and the bank. Um, so, you know, that does show sort of that, you know, there, there is the possibility of at least reference points for arm's length pricing and conceivably in the future, you know, you could even have that break out further and just have a, you know, a sales organization and, and, a, and a financing organization that, that kind of, you know, te team up to, uh, to do that using someone, another company's hardware and, and software suite. Um, as, far as, as far as investors, um, I mean, I, I do know, you know, from the beginning, uh, the, uh, you know, the questions, uh, I think, when companies pitch to investors are always like, how do we look at this business? Like, are we comparing this to a, you know, are we comparing this like uh, to subscription models and we should think about this like ARPU or sh should we think of this like a microfinance bank? And I think the answer is none of the above, hence the strange beasts, uh, duck-billed platypus uh, situation uh, that we find ourselves in. Um, and I think these, these steps will kind of, uh, um, um, you know, take steps to sort of demystify it a bit. As far as like whether there's investors at the ready, that if there was a, a a uh, bank, uh, a finance company that all it did was acquire pay-as-you-go receivables and service them. And as pointed out, this would this would take you know this would take um, you know some more maturing of the industry because you need kind of things like backup servicers and and, and things things of that nature um, and and system systems that were basically licensed where the bank could use the system to control the on-off switch. Um, in in the device, which most of, most of these companies would have, you, you'd have to have all those things develop. So I, I think it's it's probably more of a um, the, as the companies sort of basically and the industry sort of disaggregates and, and these these companies start to split out into different things. You'll probably see investors with different risk profiles or different motivations looking at different types of companies. Thanks very much, Chad. Um, look, we have a couple of additional questions coming in, and again, conscious of time, uh, I'll just fire them out. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how data pooling between MNOs or mobile network operators and pay-as-you-go companies or providers could help the sector leverage consumer insights? Uh, I actually have a perspective on that, but please. Uh, it says primarily for Dan, uh, but uh, either Dan or Chad. I'm just reading the question one second. 
Dan, while you're preparing your answer, this is Alexander here. Maybe I can just jump in with a couple of uh, quick uh, shameless plugs, if I may. Uh, so for those of you on the line, if you're interested in, in these types of issues, uh, digging deeper, just wanted to let you know that uh, we will be in Kigali at the big uh, uh, Unlocking Solar Capital Conference. We're, we're holding a side event, uh, and by we, I'm referring to uh, CGAP uh, Lighting Global colleagues uh, from IFC and World Bank and GOGLA, so please uh, look for us there. And we're also going to be doing a, a follow-on paper uh, with uh, CDC, the UK's development finance institution, that touches on some of the issues that, that Dan Godet mentioned regarding the ties, the necessary ties between the UPCO and the FINCO and, and the difficulty in, in, in separating them because of the, the servicing. And one, one last thing to note uh, that isn't on this slide, but um, uh, we're also digging into issues about uh, the credit risk side of these businesses, uh, best practices, uh, et cetera. So be on a lookout for those. Um, I just wanted to, to sneak that in there uh, before we, uh, we, we go further into the Q&A. Yeah, as I understand the question, how will the data pooling between MNOs and PG providers. One of the things that we are finding out in the US is the kind of purchases made by a mobile phone customer and the kind of data plan they use, how long they have used it, how frequently they have fallen behind is a very good indicator of their overall credit risk. So if you have a customer who has been uh, with a mobile phone company for some time, and the mobile phone company has a good bit of data on what the customer has been buying and the overall spending of that customer. That can provide a good deal of data on the customer's income patterns and payment ability. And that's what I meant by coordination between PG providers and MNOs. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, an additional question. Did you consider how this model would look as a horizontal versus vertical and how this might change the math? Uh, would the numbers just not work because of the small size of each transaction and having to share the cost across companies? Uh, you know, as Chad mentioned, you can separate the design and manufacturing from uh, the retailing and financing, but then going across companies, I don't know how that will work. You need a few large players for these, uh, this to be attractive to investors and for securitization and other markets to work. So I can see people saying, I don't want to manufacture this. I don't want to design this. That is a mature product. We'll just buy it from somebody else but then you will need to keep the rest of it in one business uh, for, you know, for in the near future. And once the companies get to be of sufficient scale, then you can probably start separating them further. But I don't see a cross company collaboration on this working that well initially, you know, other than sharing customer credit data. I mean, I, I would also point out another thing is right now, you know, there's this kind of very idiosyncratic um, payment plans and whatnot. There, there hasn't really been um, sort of a, a standard settled on uh, for how these payment plans work, where if you look at things like securitizations of car loans that might go across, you know, multiple different originators of those loans, those pretty much all work the same way. Somebody puts down a down payment, they have a certain number of years uh, to pay the principal and interest. It bears a certain interest rate, and it's it's agreed generally how that interest is uh, calculated and accrued, um, and and the the buyers have a certain FICO score or whatever that that everyone can kind of reference. So you know there's a bunch of things that everyone is kind of settled on as the standard for the industry, and you know I I don't know of any kind of new types of innovative sort of car loan products that are out there that you know, maybe don't don't have a stated interest rate at all, which in the case of a lot of pay-as-you-go solar, solar companies is the case. Um, so, you know, I think it would take probably further maturing of the industry and standardization of what that, what that loan looks like. And, you know, and then maybe that pooling is going to be possible, but right now you'd be kind of pooling together a lot of sort of different things that, you know, would make that securitization uh, 
very difficult to analyze. Thank you. Um, it looks like there are a couple of follow-on questions from Barbara. Um, I'm not sure I understand this one, but uh, what if I don't want to finance this and can the OPCO survive on fees alone? I mean, the way I understand it is credit is absolutely needed by these customers because they don't have the money to pay for these systems up front. So to, to make these things available, you need to have the system and the credit. And for reasons we have discussed right now, it's right now not easy to separate the two. So OPCO getting fees, I assume it's from some FinCO, but that will require the separation of the OPCO activities from the financing, which I think will take time. And uh, this is Jamaria. Right. <clears throat> to address Barbara's question really quick on this, uh, we don't need to forget that uh, uh, OPCO surviving on fees is, uh, is impossible because um, the customer base, is, is uh, uh, they cannot afford uh, strong and prompt payments. So we are talking about uh, maybe $10 payments for the installation and the solar on, of the solar home system. And then based on the experience that we had, we have seen that the rest of the payment is throughout 36 months. So uh, the, the initial payment or even paying uh, like uh, uh, a bigger fee uh, just to have the op cost sustaining itself uh, uh, is not possible considering the target market that the pay you go model is uh, uh, most of the time addressing. Actually, if I could pile on here, uh, Alexander from, from CGAP. Um, th this is an issue that partnering with financial institution uh, is is one that we looked into uh, and, and continue looking into, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for, for all of the reasons that we've mentioned. We actually did shop it around to several banks and, and microfinance institutions to see if, if that type of a free model could work, uh, but we, we, we ran into barriers, I think because of the nascency and, and earliness of the, the business model, that it, it has to be integrated in, in this sort of way, which, which we've said a, a few times, but I just wanted to note that we, we have looked at it. Uh, another possibility is maybe a microfinance institution developing uh, the, 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 the other aspects of it. And, and there's a few that are actually starting to, to do that, uh, MicroCred and, and Finca. And, and we're, we're working on, on another uh, uh, project to see how that might pan out. Uh, so stay tuned for, for more on that issue. Thanks very much for chiming in, uh, Alexander and Jamaria. Um, look, I, again, we have a, another couple of questions from Barbara, and Barbara, it's, it's fa uh, fascinating and fantastic that you're um, you're as engaged in this. Um, I would suggest, um, so perhaps I'll just touch on the last question, but I would suggest that if there are additional points to follow up, um, you should feel free to reach out to us. I'm very happy to have a more detailed conversation by phone or or exchange an email. Um, so, so this need not be the end of the of the conversation because clearly it's um, it's one that requires a little bit more digging. Um, so Barbara asks, um, is this a model that's based on credit dependency um, from a from a customer perspective? Uh, yes, very much so because customers don't have the money to pay for these systems. So providing financing is absolutely critical. And, and I would point out managing well, I mean, that collection process oh, is absolutely critical. Right. I mean, there is a cash market for solar home systems, but then they don't need a software platform to run them, and they probably don't have embedded technology, either keypad or embedded embedded uh, SIM cards uh, to operate. Like the the bit here is that it creates a much bigger market um, when you can finance it because it is one of those items that for the customer has a spectacular return on investment but is entirely CapEx. It has a huge upfront cost that the customers can't get over. But if they can get over it, if you, um, it has a huge return on investment. And that's exactly the type of asset that typically you know, uh, uh, calls for finance. Great, thank you. Uh, please go ahead, Dan. I see another question. How do you think the financial side should be regulated and supervised? Um, uh, this is why it is very important to be clear on what the implied interest rate is so we don't get into the allegations of very high rates and so on and so forth. 
data exists across all countries, including United States. If you look at these uh, payday loan companies here who charge very high rates, so there needs to be some transparency. And now the regulation, I think, is is up to the local governments. But uh, many of these things appear to have high rates because people don't really think about how much it costs to service these payments. Uh, with all of these locking, unlocking, customer calling in and saying, okay, I was a few days behind, please unlock my system, all of that, if it, even if it is quite a bit automated, still adds costs that don't exist in regular collection systems. So that's why the transfer price and other issues will become very important because if the finance side starts looking very profitable, there will be questions about are the rates which are being charged too high. So that's why there is even more need to provide disaggregated data that tells people how much the operating side is making and how much the financing side is making. Indeed, and I um, just sort of one point on uh, um, on your comments, uh, Dan. Um, as the sector, any sector becomes more visible, um, particularly providing services that are typically um, within the space of government. So, energy services questions will arise. Um, you know, are poor. Uh, customers, and again, not all customers are poor, but are lower income customers um, and those who don't have an alternative um, being um, sort of being manipulated or being overcharged. So I do think that that transparency will become very relevant uh, down the road. Um, look, we've gone over our hour, uh, which is what we had agreed, um, so I think that we have come to the close. Um, I, oh, gosh, just have one last question. Um, uh, where's Okay, um, if you'll permit me, I'll just ask this question very quickly and then we'll definitely wrap up. Um, a question from Matt. We see an increase in solar home system sales on a cash basis and not pay as you go, where the credit part is taken care of by a local MFI. Is this a frequent trend and then um, another type of competition to take into account? Um, I imagine this is country specific. Um, Matt, um, please feel free to just indicate if you're seeing that in a particular country. Otherwise, um, maybe Chad, you could jump in very quickly and then we'll wrap up. Sure, and you know the the, tr the truth is, um, you know, if a if a microfinance bank already has a relationship with a customer and understands their creditworthiness, that is probably extremely competitive with what the Paygo companies are offering because it, then then uh, the technology stack that's needed is is much lower and it could be lower cost. It doesn't need a keypad or embedded SIM, and it doesn't need a software suite, uh, and uh, and and the customer service can leverage the customer service that the microfinance bank would already have with the customer. So in the cases where, where that's the case, I think that's, um, that, that is a competitive solution. You know, I think the, what, the magic of what pay, PayGo Solar has unlocked is that these customers that didn't have any banking relationship of any kind before can walk in and buy these things on credit. And that sort of, I, you know, I think unlocked a huge sort of latent market of people who didn't have any sort of uh, credit relationship. But those who already have access to uh, traditional credit can probably arrange their affairs where it, it does end up being, uh, being cheaper. Great. Thank you very much, Chad, and sorry to rush this. So we are about five minutes over. Again, um, thank you very much indeed uh, for your questions. Um, I see a couple of additional ones trickling in here, but we can't extend, uh, unfortunately. Um, so um, we will formally end uh, the session. Um, if anyone would like, uh, uh, let me just check Dan and Chad, are you able to stay on for maybe another five minutes or so just to take the last couple of questions, um, recognizing that, uh, that uh, we do need to formally close and then we'll just keep um, the next few minutes for anyone who wants to stay over. Yeah, I'm available. I can do five more minutes. Yep. Okay, great. So, look, before we, um, sorry, before I formally, formally close the formal session, I just want to acknowledge um, Dan Waldron, who's one of the four authors together with Alexander Germaria and myself and has played an absolutely pivotal role um, in getting this paper done. And also, of course, thank um, Dan Gode, who was a key sounding board uh, and a key source of insight uh, on the financial analysis um, piece, um, as well as Chad and others uh, with whom we consulted during this, uh, during this exercise. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, you can send, uh, sorry, we, we'll add our email addresses in the chat. Uh, in the chat. 
in case you have additional questions. But let me just take one or two last ones, and we will close in about four, four or five minutes. Um, so please, um, if you have additional questions beyond that point, please put them in an email. Um, so a question from George. Will this OPCO um, FinCo separation process induce companies to be increasingly driven towards low-hanging fruits? And I think that actually ties into Barbara's question, or sort of financially exclu uh, excluded people with low or no credit histories. I mean, to the extent the PAYGO market and companies enable people without any credit to obtain some credit, and if that information is then available in some database, so there is credit history available for them, it's all around good for everybody. It is not the cheapest solution. As Chad just mentioned, the cheapest solution would be uh, that you already have access to credit and use that and get a much simpler system without all of this technology needed for uh, timely collections and collection enforcement but we are talking people who would otherwise not get anything and now they will get something and that if they can then use that information to get more credit from other people saying hey i'm a good credit i paid off all these systems or paygo companies then start financing bigger ticket items so that will be very sort of supportive of economic growth in those countries Yes, uh, this is Jamaria. Uh, another interesting point to make that uh, Pep and I, Alexander, and then Waldon have seen that uh, uh, most of, the, of these customers they do not have a, a credit history at all, and they will um, they are left out from the credit market. However, um, with this model, with this Pego model, they start creating some sort uh, of a credit history. And after, uh, in the least one uh, uh, model, after paying for like two, three years, the, the solar home system, uh, they acquire the solar home system and it becomes unlocked. So at that point, uh, they can use the, these mini assets that they have as a, some sort of collateral and to, have, uh, to use that to have access to maybe educational loans, uh, other type of loans. So this, this model not only allows them to start creating some sort of credit history, but to uh, expand their access to additional services. I think that's very important, particularly for the bottom of, uh, um, of the pyramid. And if I could say a word on that from here, Alexander from CGAP, um, we did actually work with, with a, a Paysigo solar company called Phoenix to develop a, a product that served their customers' needs with respect to uh, uh, financing for, for education. So the idea being that, that this could be a platform for a broader type of uh, financial inclusion beyond uh, just the initial solar home system to, to get to those uh, unbanked uh, customers. Of course, a lot of the PAYGO companies are already doing that with, with follow-on assets. Um, but, but then, you know, an interesting question is, can they go beyond uh, the, the very natural adjacencies from, uh, from a solar home system to a TV to uh, maybe a, a mobile phone to, to something that's just like a, a cash loan for, for the same types of customers. Um, of course, that raises a whole host of questions regarding, you know, uh, customer protection and, and making sure that the, the customers are treated well in, in this regard. Uh, but the, th those aren't unanswerable questions. Those, those are issues that we can tackle as, as the market develops. 